So in yesterday's video, I talked about some economics model that would predict that we will reach full AI automation in 2040, as you can see in this graph. In 2040, we have 100% automation, whereas in 2036, we only have 20% automation. And what is driving most of this automation is that we're spending more compute on training very large models. So what this graph represents is how you can decompose this increase in compute spend on large training runs into different factors. So the different factors here are one, how much are we spending on training runs? Two, how many flops are we getting for the money that we're paying? And three, how many actual flops are we using to train our neural networks for the flops that we're paying for? So you can see those three factors here. In yellow, we have hardware, which is how many flops we're getting per dollar. In green, you have software, which is how many 2022 flop you get per flop you're purchasing, meaning how many flops are you getting to train your neural networks actually from the flop you're purchasing. And the red and blue curves correspond to how much money we're actually spending on our training runs. Blue is how much dollars we're spending on flop globally, meaning how much money is being invested into AI hey, hardware globally, how much money is flowing into NVIDIA, how much money is flowing into IWS and Google Cloud. And in red, we have a diffraction of this global flop that is spent on training, meaning from all of the GPUs that are being used currently to do things like inference, research, and sometimes training, how many of these uh, GPUs are actually being used to train our very best model? So yesterday, I spent a lot of time explaining those concepts, but I don't think I really explained what the main takeaway of this report was, because this report is actually about takeoff speeds. It's called what a compute-centric framework says about takeoff speeds. And the website is literally called takeoffspeeds.com. So what do we mean by takeoff speed here? And why does it actually matter? By takeoff speed in this report, he's talking about the time it would take to go from 20% automation to 100% automation, meaning from 2036 to 2040, if you look at those vertical lines here. So basically here, the takeoff speed is exactly 3.8 years, which is not a long time. But if you go into more aggressive scenarios, so if you select aggressive here, you see other scenarios where the takeoff speed is only 0.1 years, meaning a month. So one of the main contributions of his work was really to model these kind of takeoff scenarios where you could get some fast takeoff that only lasts a month here, or you can get some longer takeoff that takes four years. And one thing to understand here is that what is driving most of the automation between 2036 and 2040 is actually a progress in AI R&D. So we have AIs that can do better AI R&D by themselves. If you wanna get technical here, Tom's model is actually a semi-endogenous gross model, meaning that there are variables inside and outside the model that affect the overall growth of the model. So if you look at the key dynamics from his economic model, we said there are a lot of loops where the more we invest in software, hardware and training, the better your AIs get and the more automation can later invest into more improvements in software, hardware, and training. And if we look at the full economic model, we see that there are different factors that are external, like population growth. But other than that, most of the factors are internal. And all of these positive feedback loops behind AI R&D and capital and efficiency of hardware and efficiency of software is what is driving most of the automation in Tom's report. So Tom's report, is basically modeling this effect where the more we invest in AI systems, the more our AI systems are helping us design better ships, design better software, and also do better AI R&D to design better AI experiments to run. And there's like a lot of those positive feedback loops uh, scenarios that are taken into account this, into this report, which was not the case in Ajia Kutra's report, which was the previous report. So if we compare with the previous report, uh, with uh, comparing bio anchors here, we said that AGS predictions where these dotted lines here, where um, Tom's report gives those uh, full lines here, where you have those uh, jumps in log log plot, which are uh, pretty huge. But yesterday, when I was looking at this plot, I didn't talk about the actual thing uh, that was going on here, which is the increase in compute. So in yesterday's video, I talked about how we could decompose this uh, compute being spent on our training runs with uh, how much spending we're doing overall, what is our hardware progress and what is our software progress and multiplying those three factors. And I've talked about this uh, abstract effective flop gap between when we would reach 20% of automation and when we would reach 100% uh, of automation. So basically have AGI. 
but I didn't give like a visual explanation of this uh, effective flop gap. So if you look at this compute graph, which I think represents how much effective compute uh, we're spending on large running runs, we have that uh, at 20% automation, we have something like 2E32. And if we are 100% automation, the effective compute is actually uh, something like uh, 138. So anyway, what I wanted to mention is that we can really see this uh, compute gap being crossed. From here to here, we have about uh, four to six order of magnitudes to cross, and those are being crossed in only four years. In only four years, our training runs would get one million times larger in terms of flops, which is actually insane if you think about it. So another way to look at compute increasing as we cross some effective flop gap is to look at uh, this graph by Daniel Kukotajlo. So one way to look at this is that on the left, you have different orders of magnitude of compute. So this is a log plot and the straight lines are actually power laws or exponential. And on the x-axis, each square is actually a decade. So you go from 2000 to 2010 to uh, 2020. So what this training run is telling you about the last decade of uh, training runs is that in roughly one decade, you have uh, three and a half orders of magnitude more compute being spent on our training runs. And this color distribution here actually represents the distribution of compute requirements to train AGI using 2020 algorithms. So given what we know in 2020 and how to train language models, how much more compute we would need to train AGI in 2020 if everything continued to scale the same way. So each of these different scenarios for compute correspond to a different line here. And the reason why these lines are going down is because of algorithmic improvements. And one way to actually compare the different predictions by AJ Kotra and Tom Davidson, that in AJ Kotra's model, you would have uh, this median amount of compute being required to train AGI here. And at some point, you would be spending less on training runs because you would be hitting some diminishing returns. And at this point, uh, your slope uh, is a little bit uh, smaller. And so you reach these uh, AGI training requirements only after one, two, three, four decades after AlexNet, so around 2050. But in Daniel Kukutajo's model, which is actually close to uh, Tom Davidson's aggressive model, you can actually use a tractor beam, meaning that uh, you actually continue on this trend for a little longer because you see some actual returns from um, having better AI models. And so you start investing more in AI models until you reach uh, your AGI training requirements. That uh, in the case of Daniel Kutajlo, those training requirements are kind of the lower hand of the compute distribution. So those are the most aggressive requirements for training AGI. So in this case, only about uh, six orders of magnitude of what we're using right now. Tom talks about this graph here that summarized Daniel Kukutajlo's understanding of AGI's report um, in his blog post called What a Compute-Centric Framework Says About AI Takeoff Speeds, which is another piece of writing he posted on top of his report. And I think there's a lot of clarification here that are um, useful to stress because yesterday I, I didn't talk about the main conclusions from his report. So his personal predictions that are very much in flux and not robust are 10% that we have at three months takeoff, 25% that we have at one year takeoff, and uh, roughly 50% chance that it takes uh, less than three years. And again here, what he means by takeoff is going from 20% automation to 100% automation. So this uh, time here to cross the automation gap between 20% and 100%. But if you're just looking at the lower 25 percentile of the scenarios, this is still pretty wild, going from 20% automation to 100% automation in only one year or in only three months is uh, much faster than humanity could adapt to this uh, increase in automation. So, so the reason why these conclusions are wild is because you're looking at the automation of cognitive tasks in the global economy. But he actually expects the automation of AI R&D to happen before the automation of the global economy. So the reason he expects uh, automation of AI R&D to happen earlier than automation of everything else is uh, we already have a lot of data about writing code. Um, you can do R and D without actually interacting with the real world. You don't need to have robots actually building things to improve your AI R and D. And you already have models that are helping with AI R and D. 
And more generally, if you just think about OpenAI, that is uh, building better AI models, they're very familiar about AI research. They're familiar about uh, writing code. And they don't need to comply with all the regulations and all the requirements from society and having some users buy new products when they're just building things that can help them with their research workflow. They can just build it without doing any marketing, without any dramas, and uh, they can really invest all this effort into something that will be useful for them. And on top of that, when we approach AGI, there will be a lot of value in automating AI R&D because AI R&D will basically give you um, tools that will enable you to automate everything else. So when you look at this graph here, at 20% of automation of the entire economy, you need to imagine that the automation of AI R&D is already much higher. And for AI R&D, imagine you're already like at 50%, the final percent actually require maybe a much more compute or much more money. So when you reach 50%, and let's say you're still at 20% of the entire economy being automated, uh, you will stay at 50% until uh, the economy catches up. So here, most of the force behind automation comes from this AI R&D automating everything else. And if you go back to Tom's uh, alignment forum post, he mentions that if you just think about the takeoff speed in terms of AI R&D, so how do you go from 20% R&D being automated to 100% uh, AI R&D automated, his takeoff speeds are actually uh, only one year with 10% chance, uh, less than three years with 30% chance, and uh, less than 10 years with 70% chance. So they're less dramatic than here, especially for the short timeline scenario. You only have a one-year takeoff with a 10% chance and another three months takeoff. And one other thing he notes is that uh, his median AGI training requirements are pretty large. So one E36 flop, which means that if you have requirements that are lower, you would actually have much faster takeoffs. So you would get a one-year takeoff with a 40% chance, and you would be 90% sure to have a less than 10-year takeoff. So this is basically what we have here in uh, Daniel Kukotajdo's tractor beam, where um, his requirement was actually much lower than uh, the median case from AGI Kodra. And maybe you have even less uh, constraining requirements for AGI. Maybe you think you can train AGI with only one E30 flops. So one thing you can do is go into playground and put uh, one E30 here and uh, run the simulation. But for the more general case, Tom gives uh, this plot where for any AGI training requirements, you can see the time it would take to go from 20 to 100%, so the takeoff speed in years. And as you can see, the less compute you need to train AGI, the shorter your takeoff speed. So as you can see, the less compute you need to train your AGI, and the less years your takeoff take. And on top of that, the average speed crossing this effective flop gap is higher. So as I mentioned yesterday, the speed crossing the effective flop gap is actually related to the growth in spending, the growth in hardware progress, and the growth in software progress with this relationship where you have an addition here because of how uh, log work and the fact that you're uh, actually multiplying the three factors to get uh, your effective compute in your larger training run. So what this means here is that when you look at all of these curves in uh, yellow or green, blue, and red, uh, you can basically add the slopes of these curves uh, to get the speed at which you're crossing your compute gap. Because your compute gap, if you look at uh, the graph below, is um, how long it would take to go from here to here. And you can play along with different AGI training requirements uh, to prove what I said before, that um, actually the average speed crossing is higher for uh, lower AGI training requirements. So here, when we look at the compute that is being spent on the largest training runs, uh, per year, if you have uh, some very large training requirements, so 1E40, uh, so you can see that the, most of the compute is trained when you reach uh, at a year very close to AGI. And if you look at the growth per year, uh, you see that the average growth is uh, pretty low. So here, most of the time, it's uh, between uh, 0 and 2% a year, I think. And then here, it uh, starts getting uh, insanely high. So on average, it's pretty low. But if you have some um, much more crazy compute requirements, let's say 
1E30. Um, you can see that uh, the growth is uh, much more spread out. So the growth rate is actually pretty high already in the middle and only increases to uh, maybe double its amount or triple its amount here. But it's, it's not the same as uh, for 1E40 where uh, really most of the growth was at the end. And Scott Alexander also talks about the same effects when he talks about Davidson's model of uh, takeoff speeds. He basically looks at these uh, three different scenarios for uh, takeoff that people have given over the years. So here we have three different takeoff scenarios. No takeoff, slow takeoff, and fast takeoff. Where no takeoff is just linear growth, we don't have any exponentials. But in the middle, uh, for slow takeoff, we have super exponential growth meaning that we have this continuous thing happening where basically you have AIs that are able to automate our entire economy reaching human level, but uh, we never have any discontinuous jump. And in the Yudkowsky scenario, uh, we have sudden foom, so a fast takeoff, where at the end you have this uh, huge um, improvement that passes human level. And one could say that uh, looking at where we are right now with Claude, uh, GPT-4.0 and everything else, that we're probably in a slow takeoff world. But this term, uh, slow takeoff, is something that uh, I don't think Tom Davidson or Scott Alexander really like talking about. These terms of slow takeoff and fast takeoff don't really tell you what is happening before you get to AGI. And if we go back to our graphs here, you see that this uh, scenario where we have very large training requirements of 1E40 actually gives us something that looks like um, fast takeoff, where you basically have most of the computers being trained at the end. But this fast takeoff scenario is actually very long, um, takes more years than if you were in this scenario of uh, 1E30, where um, in only three to four years, you would get this uh, takeoff that is actually much smoother, but um, also faster in terms of uh, average speed at which you're crossing your effective a compute gap. So again, there's uh, probably a lot of more things I could be talking about in this report. What I really wanted to say was that uh, this particular model I've been talking about from Tom Davinson is really um, about takeoff speeds. It's called what a compute-centric framework says about AI takeoff speeds, and the website is uh, takeoffspeeds.com. So the entire point is to model takeoff speed, something that was not taken into account in a Jack Cotra's report. So let me know in the comments if you would like to see me make more videos on AI timelines and maybe other parts of this report. Uh, but as of right now, that's it for today. And I'll see you tomorrow for another video.